the fourth session is the keynote speak in which the intervention will be in English so if you need translation please take your headsets now and I wish to remind you that uh, we have the uh, Jordan Valley uh, round uh, or trip tomorrow on the last day of the conference so registration will be at the table in the outside hall if you wish to register so that we have the accurate number of passengers and uh, we can provide you with the necessary transportation and other services Mr. Stephen Gasteyer is an associate professor at the uh, Michigan State University. He's a researcher in community development, ecological justice, and transformations of the natural landscape with focus on food, energy, water, and public health. Uh, Stephen Gastar is Associate Professor of Sociology at Michigan State University in East Lansing, uh, Michigan. Um, his work, uh, his research focuses on community development, environmental justice, and the political ecology of landscape change with specific attention to food, energy, water, and public health. Uh, his presentation today is entitled Settler Colonial, Socio-Technical Savior, Dead Red Canal, the Jordan Valley and its Discontents. And I'd like to welcome uh, Stephen Gastar. Thank you. Uh, I will begin, I, I want to begin by first thanking, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Tastel for, for the uh, kind introduction and also for the invitation to be here. This has been to date a very, very stimulating conference, really, really interesting uh, um, discourse about and discussion about the, the critical issues. Um, and uh, I am re really very honored to have been placed in the position of being the keynote speaker. I, I, as I said during the break to uh, Professor Testal that I'm uh, uh, really, I really feel not quite worthy to be the person who gets to be at, have the center stage and not be limited to 20 minutes, but, uh, but I'm also very honored to be that person. Um, I do apologize for doing this in English. My Arabic is, is simply not as good as I wish it were. Um, but uh, we will proceed, and I hope that the uh, translators can continue to do their marvelous work, and you will understand what it is that I have to offer, and uh, hopefully uh, it will provide some stimulating uh, thoughts and, and stimulate some interesting discussion. So. Let me begin uh, by clicking yes to that. As is true in other settler colonial societies, Israel struggles to address issues of ecological sustainability. Most, the most, among the most glaring examples of, e of, of the sustainability crisis is the Dead Sea which is estimated to shrink one meter each year, and where structures once on the shoreline now sit more than a kilometer away from the water's edge. This is, of course, largely, though not entirely, the result of the diversion of, of water to, the, to Israel's national water carrier that would have flowed to the Jordan River from Lake Tiberias. There have been multiple media stories and reports on the crisis of the shrinking sea. The diversion of the Jordan River is related not only to, to the shrinking Dead Sea, but to the disparity in water access between Palestinians and Israelis, specifically, though not exclusively, in the Jordan Valley. The most high profile of solutions as in is, uh, is an Israeli-proposed canal between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea, 
and it continues to, to receive apparent beginnings and criticism in, in equal measure. It is estimated to cost around $10 billion, that's an estimate from the World Bank, and the canal has received support not only from the Israeli government, from, but from the Jordanian authorities, who see the mega project as providing desalinized water that could, indirectly, alleviate chronic water scarcity in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which is, of course, exacerbated, that is, the water scarcity, by influxes of refugees, most recently from Iraq and Syria. But the, but the Red Sea Dead Sea mega project is only the most glaring of the technologies that are employed to address the emergence of crisis, significantly in Area C and Jordan Valley, but by no means exclusively. In many ways, much more significantly, in terms of the effort that we see along these lines in, on the ground, um, is the development of wastewater treatment and reuse and, and desalinization and how they are trumpeted as solutions to recurring drought, higher average temperatures, declining water tables. This paper investigates the canal and associated technologies through the lens of settler colonial studies. The canal follows a pattern of techno-scientific, or what I'm calling techno-scientific solutions that seek not only to remake landscapes, facilitating settlement and marginalizing indigenous populations, but also to correct damage caused from earlier infrastructural efforts to facilitate settlement. Notably, proponents of the canal reject more, um, more inclusive efforts that would repair the Jordan River, allowing more water to flow into the Dead Sea while simultaneously recognizing water rights of Palestinian inhabitants. Rather, the canal must be understood as emblematic of a preferred mode of environmental remediation that focuses on technology, including desalination and wastewater treatment and reuse as the form of ecosystem management that proposes to deliver water resources through, safe, through, through sale, transfer, and installation, but further embroil Palestinian residents in dependency on Israel while failing to address issues of rights and sovereignty. While it is notable that the international donors and, invest, and investors specifically the World Bank, France, and the United States, work to move the project forward, there are also significant opponents to the mega project within Israel and the international community. Notably, the Palestinian Authority, after signing on as an initial signatory in 2005, has refused to participate in the endeavor. What I will do is look at this suite of projects and make comparisons to other settler colonial endeavors, notably in the United States, Australia, um, and I will make some references to South Africa, where mega projects are equally proposed as techno-eco solutions um, with similar discontents. So let us now first turn to this question of uh, that's on the that's. Um, central to this conference, Jordan Valley and Area C as sites of ecological and social crisis. This paper is about how discourses around land and water have emerged in the context of Area C and the Jordan Valley, and generally in the area of Palestine. British scholars Melissa Leach and Robert Mearns describe discourses as, rep as the representation of an issue that is open to a range of suitable solutions and the silencing of those who have an alternative representation. We have become accustomed to hearing the situation in Area C and specifically the Jordan Valley as either in the middle of or teetering on the edge of crisis. The discourse around the kind of crisis varies depending on whom is, is doing the talking. So during this conference, we have heard much about the crisis of the Jordan Valley for Palestinians. It involves a crisis of people, of settlement by one people, Israelis, which uses land and natural resources 
the, uh, resource constraints to limit the opportunities for another people, Palestinians, to live in, in that given space. In other words, this is a crisis of territorial expulsion. Ecological systems are enrolled in this crisis and are seen as the result of political moves. For instance, the, the decline in the flow of springs is depicted as resulting from the digging of wells and extraction of groundwater in settlements. This representation of the issue is largely science, silenced by by a donor and Israeli-driven discourse about a looming ecological crisis of scarcity of natural resources. And in natural, I would say natural, in quotes. This discourse, sometimes but all, not, um, not always repeated with intention of malice, discusses the crises of drought, well depth, stream flow in springs, and water scarcity, um, generally as a factor of population growth, without defining whose, as well as waste management and, and most prominently, the declining Dead Sea. These are described as technocratic problems. Defined in this way, the problem of the Jordan Valley and Area C is solved by a, by a single or maybe even a suite of technologies that can be employed through depoliticized development processes that focus on discourses such as the necessity of efficiency in water management. This is not to say that the issues listed above do not exist but rather that certain discourses designate those issues as per purely technical and managerial and discuss particular solutions as related while designating other issues like ongoing settler expansion or water capture by the settlements as illegitimate or at least unproductive to getting the job done. What I would like to argue is that the, the discourse described above is typical of what science and technology studies have, um, has called socio-technical imaginaries. These imaginaries involve a combination of narrative and design to create socio-technical uh, socio to create, sorry, socio-technical systems presumed to have particular impacts on assemblages of human and non-human actors. This fixation on ecological change and then restoration through imagined socio-technical systems is not unique to the Jordan Valley or even Palestine, but rather typical of what we, we have come to call settler colonial systems such as the Israeli settler colonial project in Palestine. So I will now describe, uh, discuss a little bit settler colonialism. There is, there is a two decades old scholarly um, literature that uses a comparative framework to understand processes of, co of colonialism and in particular settler colonialism. This literature has revealed a, revealed a similarity in processes of landscape transformation for the purposes of facilitating settlement by, European, uh, by Europeans and the erasure of, of indigenous people. Whether in Australia, Algeria, Argentina, Canada, Israel, the, the United States, or South Africa, the process has followed a remarkably similar pattern with some differences based largely on the extent to which the settlement project was, was dependent on indigenous labor. Colon the colonial process was implemented, implemented through an explicit pattern of land use transformation, accompanied with a, with a narrative about the proper use of land along with associated laws. Anthropologist Lorenzo Veracini notes that as opposed to other forms of colonialism that, that sought the exploitation and extraction of resources, the idea was to indigenize settlers from, um, from colonizing nations, declaring them the rightful inhabitants of colonized space. The process of doing this 
is in, involved a recognizable set of settler colonial patterns that invoke uh, socio-technical imaginaries. Like other European colonial movements, settler colonialism started with the development of a narrative of indigenous pre-settlement mismanagement. One that looks at early, when one looks at early Zionist um, travel logs, one sees depictions of the failings of the Fellahin communities that are remarkably similar to the depictions of American Indian communities by explorers on the, on the American frontier, disparaging the lack of productive and organized, using air quotes, management of, of the land and landscape. As an aside, it's worth noting that Leach and Mearns, work, uh, their work in the 1990s demonstrated the extent to which these observations were often the result of fundamental misunderstandings of landscape ecology in the colonized landscape. But the misunderstandings served the discursive purpose for the colonists. The settlement process involves reimagining re land and hydrology. The settler discourse celebrates, celebrates settlements, frontiers, and vastly increased agricultural production. There is a reimagining of hydrology that is essential to actually achieving greater productivity through settlement. This involves changing water flows, both by intention and consequence. In both Israel, Palestine, and the Great Plains of the US, for instance, settler colonial governments implemented mega projects to facilitate irrigated agriculture, but also high intensity pumping of wells for irrigation. The water diversions from Lake Tiberias and, and the Jordan River here, and in the Great Plains from the Platte, Republican, and Missouri rivers, were expected to bring, about, uh, bring water to previously unirrigated landscapes at a new and previously unrecognized scale. Settler authorities did not expect in either place that the mining of groundwater would impair stream flow in the way that it did in both places. But settler societies have also tended to have a distinctly modernist techno-optimism that new settlement can be facilitated through technology, that, uh, technology to implement what sociologist Jules Bacon calls eco-social structures. Bacon argues that this framework reveals settler colonialism as an eco-social structure which produces and maintains drastic and in enduring inequalities between settlers and native peoples. This this Framework revolves around land management. The key point, and what this slide shows you is sort of the, is, um, is the, the key elements of these equal social structures in the United States, Great Plains, and in Israel, Palestine. The key point is that, as Wolf argues in his 2008 and 2011 articles, the elimination of the native is carried out precisely through the use of technologies that change land. As Bacon argues, talking about, talking about the United States, consider, of, consider again the many forms of elimination deployed in the United States to think about how each has, has a connection to questions of environment. As the table suggests, the mechanisms of eco-social eco disruption are numerous. Land is distributed, privatized, polluted, and renamed with generally no input or consent on the part of the original inhabitants. The value of, of places and beings are re redefined by, by the culture of the colonizers. I've included a comparative table for the situation of Palestine. The major difference is that, is, is that the Israeli project has not, has not been that, Palis, um, that Palestinians assimilate to become Israeli and Jewish, in contrast to the United States and Canadian government, uh, governments 
who implemented child removal and other strategies to try to force American Indians and Canadian First Nations people to become Christian laborers, having been stripped of language, culture, and, many other, and, and in many, uh, many cases, family. Still, outside of that difference, the strategies are, are quite comparable. Land has been taken and poisoned through pollution. Um, grazing lands have been mined, water diverted from Palestinian communities. Displacement and movement restrictions have not only hindered economic activities and access to holy places, but have, have served to keep Palestinians from sites of cultural knowledge, including knowledge of flora and fauna. Artifacts have been appropriated. There is, there, there is, as we have heard throughout this conference, an historical and ongoing process of land dispossession. So we must think then about what are the settler, what we might call settler colonial ambitions. Practically, implementing this kind of structural violence involves a number of steps. Identification of, of terra nullius, or empty land for settlement, and using legal, administrative, and military procedures, often, often that first prevent people from getting to their land and then declaring it empty, so it can end ripe for, con for confiscation. Delivery of resources to facilitate settlement, including critically availability of water, but also transportation networks security apparatuses to protect settlers, and technology to facilitate agricultural or other production. While this sounds a lot like the litany of what has facilitated settlement in Palestine, there are corollaries in Australia, North America, Brazil, and, to, and, and certainly South Africa, just to name a few. Development and implementation of mechanisms to contain or diminish the native population and production is also key. Gary Fields, in his work of a couple of years ago, noted, noted, that the, noted the repeated pattern of doing this through the use of, it, of the English mechanisms of enclosure. Land designation as property that is valorized through particular modes of production, specifically market-oriented production as a common mechanism of dispossession. Both the development and the implementation of, legal, of, of a legal system that validates enclosure is key to this practice. Enclosure as a mechanism has the advantage of a certain legitimacy in the global system, often using productionist, if not market, logics to justify takings. But it also has the advantage of of creating a duplicable, a duplicable legal and administrative structure that is known to produce a labor force. And, and this brings us back to the question of the laborers on, the set, on, on settlements that came up in the last question of the last panel. The removal of the indigenous population can happen dramatically at one time, such as during the Nakba in, in 1948, but, all, but as settler colonial systems move on to even further frontiers, the removal processes occur over time and in stages. These include first, small takings by non-state actors, then progressive containment, that, then state expulsion or elimination. Israel followed, uh, has followed um, uh, demonstrable action to like this to seize Negev land of the Bedouin inside Israel, for instance. Colonists, in general, have long understood the utility of treating an occupied community differentially, rewarding some and penalizing others as a way to sow division. This is obviously carried, this is obviously carried out through capricious implementation of, pop, of property laws and tax regimes, but technology can, en can enable this as well. A key strategy is to maintain a constant threat of action, to restrict the ability to cultivate land and to isolate people under threat of land loss or settlement. This leads to a precariousness of life for indigenous inhabitants that hinders the ability of a community to, ve to develop or accommodate new, uh, new and emerging 
um, needs or issues. This precariousness has the dual purpose of enabling, enabling cheap labor while also ensuring that there are incentives to leave. Other papers in this conference address the issue of Palestinian laborers on settlements, which, um, which matches this pattern. The other part of Bacon's argument is that whether in North America, South Africa, or Australia, the eco-social transformation has resulted in ecological crises. These can start with crises of water scarcity or land degradation, driven by unsustainable agricultural production systems, as happened repeatedly in North America and Australia. For Bacon, the ultimate crisis is the contribution of the settler colonial system to climate change, the costs of which are, are likely to be borne disproportionately by indigenous people globally, but specifically in, in this case by the indigenous people of North America. My argument here is that we need, to be, we, we need not be as abstract as climate change. The crises can come in the form of crises of water scarcity. I should note here that this is not necessarily unique to settler colonial systems per se. Think, for instance, of India and Pakistan. But I would argue that the same mechanisms that were used to advance European settler colonialism were advanced as part of the Euro-American Development Project and the Green Revolution in the 1970s. In the case we are studying for this conference, the Jordan Valley and Area C, water scarcity, or at least low flows in the Jordan River, was driven by the diversions of Lake Tiberias to the Israeli national water carrier, ostensibly to, as Ben-Gurion noted, make the desert bloom in the Negev, in the Negev Desert. University of Wisconsin scholar Salar, uh, Samer Alatut has, has documented how the diversion was built on a narrative of underutilized water potential, only to have that narrative switch during the 1960s to a narrative of water scarcity as, as Israeli and expatriate hydrogeologists documented the negative effects of both the diversions of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea and the heavy groundwater pumping to feed Israeli agricultural, uh, is Israeli irrigated agriculture. It is, rather than reverse the Zionist narrative of modernization, the narrative became one of innovation. Innovation has the twin advantages of legitimizing the settler, the, the settler society and, and presenting depoliticized solutions to emerging crises. Israel built a, a techno-scientific infrastructure to provide solutions to water scarcity in agriculture. As such, Israelis adapted technologies such as drip irrigation so that it could be scaled and widely ad adopted in Israel, in the 1967 occupied Palestinian territories, and around the world. Israelis widely claimed credit for improving irrigation efficiency and thus dryland agriculture um, and became a fixture of international development circles discussing the application of the technology. The notion was that water scarcity was a problem was, was a problem inefficiency of was a problem of inefficiency of use and inappropriate technology. Likewise, Israel invested in plant varieties to create or adapt more drought tolerant varieties. Again, the notion, wa the, the notion was that scarcity was about technology, this time in the form of plant genetics. I will note that I recently came across a debate among Israeli and allied and and uh, international Zionist agronomists about whether Israel can claim, the, can claim credit for the discovery of the cherry tomato, which almost certainly is a, is a land race that, that had been used for, for a very long time by small and indigenous farmers. Global experts in agricultural water use 
both came to Israel to witness the water, the water efficiency systems and trumpeted Israel's dramatic hyper-efficient water management systems. Countries around the world sought to mimic Israel's agricultural production system. For an interesting example, I'd, I would refer you to Sharif al Musa's fascinating 1997 study of the Jordanian Green Revolution. Even while trumpeting the merits of drip irrigation, Israel was entering into an era that, uh, that Israeli environmentalists have referred to as hydroscarcity. By the 1980s and early 1990s, there was virtual disappearance of the narrative of making the desert bloom. There was, as it turns out, a real problem with water availability um, uh, it for Israel to create a, a lush Europe in the Middle East. Kibbutzim were, were incentivized to switch from water thirsty crops to like tomatoes. The Jewish National Fund began to discuss planting more drought resistant trees rather than cedars. Negotiations with, with the Palestinians over, over water led to consideration of fantastic and old plans to add to the water pie. Rather than adopt a rights framework that meant giving up, giving up capacity and admitting that they, they had robbed Palestinians of uh, the Palestinian pop population of water and therefore had to, change, had to change their lifestyle, Israel floated a number of fantastic schemes, such as shipping water, shipping water in so-called Medusa bags from the Arctic to supply extra water to, to Israel-Palestine, transfers of water in long canals from Turkey that, that, would, that would transfer water in that could be used by Palestinians, and the revival of the Red Sea, Dead Sea Canal. The Red Dead Canal had a certain allure in that it could be used to switch the conversation from water rights and scarcity going on here. It's, it's not that important. Um, the Red Dead Canal had, had um, let's see, ah, had a certain allure in that it could switch, it, it could be used to switch the conversation from, from water rights to water scarcity, using the shrinking Dead Sea as a raison d'etre. The shrinking Dead Sea had been used as an example of unsustainability, generally, of the, of the Israeli system of water use, and was introduced in part to make, it, to, to make the case for the need to replenish the Jordan River and give Palestinians access as riparians. In fact, the Red Dead Canal, in concept, had existed as a notion for hundreds of years. According to Hassam Hussein's most recent article, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the mentions of the Red Dead Canal first emerged in missionary documents in the 1600s and, and was picked up in the mid-1800s mid by, by a British naval captain seeking a shorter route to India. Theodore Herzl then proposed an idea of, of a Red Dead Canal as early as, as the early 1900s as a mechanism for providing hydropower and irrigation. Israel then proposed the Red Dead again in the 1970s for hydropower. Jordan, um, Jordan then proposed a canal in the 1980s for hydropower, followed by proposals to use the canal to address joint Israeli, Jordanian, and Palestinian water needs in the 1990s. It is also provided, it also provided a proposed fix for the shrinking Dead Sea, though through a canal from the, from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea as, um, uh, as a way of overcoming what had become an ecological catastrophe. Perfect, thank you. The project, having overcome objections from environmentalists and, and financing challenges, is now moving forward at the cost of, of some $10 billion. The project promises only to, not only to raise the level of the Dead Sea, but also the turbines on the canal purport to provide energy that can power desalination plants 
that will supply Jordan with much needed water. Notably, Palestinians are neither a party to the canal nor to the forecast benefits in, the, in fresh water and energy. Beyond the cost, there are concerns about the, impacts, uh, about the impacts of mixing the waters of the Red Sea with the Dead Sea. The project has, be, has become largely about fixing a crisis, the shrinking Dead Sea, but also Jordan's lack of water with desalination that is powered by, hydro, uh, that, that is powered by hydropower generated as water flows through the canal from the, Dead sea, from the Red Sea. There are, at best, promises that at some point in the future, Palestinians can buy some of that water. I should note at this point that the Red, that the Red Dead Canal has a corollary in the United States. Um, and, and among efforts to address the chronic water sources in the Western Great Plains as, um, is a proposed canal, the Missouri, the Missouri River Diversion. The diversion is forecast to use solar power, so once again, it's a green solution to, uh, to a looming crisis, um, to, to lift water up from the Jordan River onto the so-called high plains, delivering water to irrigators, who would in turn abandon deep water wells in the shrinking, in the shrinking Ogallala Aquifer. It has also been proposed to provide a much needed water to the, to the Lakota Sioux Indians who suffer chronic water scarcity. In the case of water, water scarcity in the Jordan Valley and area, see the Red Dead Canal is not, is, not the on, is not the only proposed technological solution. Changes in, in technology have led to the development of, uh, of technological capacity, have led to the development of two technologies that have reversed Israel's water narrative, what Israeli environment, environmentalist Alon Tal calls game changers, wastewater treatment and reuse and desalination. These two new technologies become the proposed solution for questions of water scarcity. Already, Israel, had, is, Israel is regarded as having the highest percentage of water, of, of water reuse in the world, and through this alone has received global accolades. Indeed, the adoption of wastewater reuse inside Israel served as the first set of accolades from the international community. The, water, the international water industry publication Water World wrote, for instance, in 2002, since 2000, the use of treated, treated wastewater for irrigation by Israel's agricultural sector increased from 17% of water consumed by the sector to more than 50%. Regulation has been a key driver, with stringent regulations upon, uh, to upgrade affluent standards set in motion in 2000 by Israel's parliament. Notably, water reuse has been accompanied by an explosion in desalinization um, technologies. As the MIT publication Technology Review notes, on the Mediterranean beach 10 miles south of Tel Aviv, Israel, a vast, a, a vast new industrial facility hums around the clock. It is the world's largest modern seawater desalination plant, providing 20% of the, of the water consumed by the country's households. Whereas in 2004, the country relied entirely on groundwater and rain, now four seawater desalination plants account for 40% of Israel's supply, and by now, 50%. These combined technologies have allowed Israel to once again claim that they have claimed to have made the desert bloom. Indeed, this is now co a common slogan for pro-Israel groups in the United States. Israel has used this form of hydro diplomacy, offering both technology, uh, both technology and to sell desalinated water itself throughout the Mideast region including, most ridiculously in my opinion, Israel Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu's televised offer of water technology to Iran in June 2018 as a, um, as a way of getting at, of, of getting at the um, Iranian regime, which he of course doesn't like. 
It has attempted, it has also attempted to use this scarcity to abundance story as a, as a sort of legitimation project. Wit witness, for instance, Seth Siegel's book, Let There Be Water, which trumpets Israel as being, as being able to reach the, uh, teach the world how to, um, about how to deal with water scarcity. There are three points that should be noted about, the, uh, about both these solutions to water scarcity. First, they are presented as technology fixes that allow Israel to effectively ignore issues of water equity with the Palestinians. Second, they are highly capital, capital intensive and they move water purely into the realm of a commodity, a resource that can only be supplied if someone pays. A third point that is not insignificant is that wastewater treatment and reuse carries forward techno -scientific, the, the techno-scientific imaginary about the importance of water efficiency. Not a drop should be wasted. Given the accolades, it is not surprising that the, de that the development community has picked up the narrative. Increasingly funding, uh, increasingly funding wastewater reuse efforts as a way to address water issues in the West Bank in general and the Jordan Valley and Area, and area C more specifically. There are increasing investments in the, in the West Bank to address water concern, uh, concerns about water issues through wastewater treatment and reuse. Um, and Israel continues to talk about transferring desal water as a way of making up water shortages. Geographers Julie Trottier and Jean Perrier have recently written about the problematic of wastewater, wastewater as, de as a decontextualized, depoliticized prop, um, proposed solution. They argue first that the treatment of water as wasted disregards the extent to which the wasted water actually serves an ecological function in allowing for plant growth and recharging groundwater. When wastewater is treated and, and reused, some of those uh, other functions are lost. They note, for instance, that local Palestinian foods like chbeze only grows in, some, in areas like the Jordan Valley because of the inefficiency of irrigation systems. In other words, water from irrigation that is wasted ends up being the water that these plants use to grow. The second concern is that they, that they raise is that cap, the capital intensive nature of the technology when applied piecemeal in communities across the West Bank and without adequate attention to, to um, local governance systems as through, a given, as through many of the donor efforts is that it can have the effect of disempowering local water tenure and empowering non-local investors at the expense of local farmers. At a minimum, they argue, wastewater treatment and reuse should be applied through intensive engagement with local water management committees. Refining the critique. What I do not mean to suggest here is that there is no place for new technologies in addressing the, the very real issues in Area C and the Jordan Valley. But I do want to return to the problem of crises and the tendency of settler colonialism to create crises. As Bacon argues, the, the process of settlement involves creating eco-social structures that transform human nature interactions and in doing, doing so inflicts violence on the indigenous population. In the process of doing that, Settler colonial societies have consistently created ecological crises that invariably impact the indigenous population more than the settlers. These range from water crises in the Murray-Darling Dar um, Basin of Australia and the Great Plains of North America to the water crisis in the West Bank and the, sh and the sinking Jed Sea. These issues do affect the settler population to some degree, and as such, these ecological crises have to be addressed, both, both to legitimate the settler project and to, and to mitigate, what, what affects, um, mitigate what effects impact the Israelis. It is here that we move into, techno into the techno-optimism of settler colonialism.
The emergence of crisis, of crisis has led to the development of new technologies that are meant to ad address the crisis. Technologies can create their own path dependency. The Red Dead Canal, which started most recently in, the, in 1990 as a proposal to, to address the shrinking Dead Sea, is, is moving forward mostly because of the water crisis in Jordan, for instance. Wastewater reuse has become a focus in and of itself and is used by Israel along with desalinization as part of a legitimation campaign. The problem with the implementation of these new technologies is not that they are inherently problematic, but that they create a development discourse around technical options rather than a discourse around the underlying causes and how to mitigate the injustices that are inherent in them. The issue is, that, is the extent to which development in Area C and the Jordan Valley becomes about implementation of technologies that may solve some of the water, water scarcity problems without addressing these underlying political injustices and possibly creating new as of yet unforeseen issues. This conference began with a call for the development of participatory plans. It seems to me that, the develop, that development sought, uh, that sought justice would be much more about participatory processes through which local people could be empowered to live lives of dignity and much less about a discussion of technologies. So I look forward to your reactions and questions. Salim. Um, thank you, Stephen, for a wonderful uh, presentation, which I think uh, was overwhelming with its scope. Uh, I want to ask you about the second part, which is the subordination of agricultural technology to the political economy of control. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what I want to you to uh, explain to us is how the Palestinians can benefit from a reconfiguration of the dead, red, dead canal so that this imbalance uh, of access and control can be potentially beneficial. Mm. Because obviously, as you alluded, the red dead can uh, uh, deliver some positive um, uh, features about the loss of water supply, the declining level of the Dead Sea, and so on. And with it, I, I would like you to address, if possible, you, you sort of lump together the uh, manner in which the Israelis uh, substitute technological innovation uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the negative sides of control that come with it. Uh, you sort of lump together forms like drip irrigation, which is extremely beneficial and very l less capital intensive than desalinization, which is very capital intensive and, yeah. and we have no access to it because of the Im immense amount of capital investment. So I think it would be beneficial to distinguish between these two forms. One is accessible, yeah. not the other accessible. But if you can uh, answer the first part of the question, I would be grateful. Yeah, so, um, so shall I just for, to the organized? Yeah, would you like to? Uh, thank you, Stefan. Could you please elaborate more on the piecemeal you uh, mentioned in the context of Trottier paper? The, I'm sorry, the piecemeal? In the context of Trottier paper, you ah. mentioned it. Please elaborate more. Yes. Uh, 
just very briefly, if you, if you have an update, because from my understanding, uh -huh. um, I'm not really sure, is this plan going through? I mean, I don't, as far as I understand, actually the money isn't there. I mean, everyone's waiting for the Americans to show up with the money bags. And, um, and then because of what happened about a year ago, I don't remember, where an Israeli guard killed two Jordanians, uh -huh. the embassy was closed, so there was, it was very much politicized, and do you, ha do you know, like, an update? Um, yeah. Okay. Should, shall I go with that? So, um, so let me refer, return, um, make sure I remember. So let me return to, um, Salim's excellent question. Um, I think, so, so the, the question of how Palestinians could benefit from the Red Dead Canal um, is a good one, right? I, I think the, the, um, the way that the canal has been configured is, is certainly not one that leads to easily seeing how how um, it could lend itself to a real Palestinian participation. Having said that, one, the, the issue is ultimately political. Who gets, to, if they are, especially if they are, if it is used to create desal, desalinated water that then gets distributed, um, could Palestinians benefit by, by um, being part of that and receiving part of the water that is provided? Presumably, they could. Um, the The issue is is that um, the Red Dead has continuously been proposed as a way, precisely, of not talking about equitable water rights. It gets proposed solely as a way of talking about how do we how do we grow the amount of water coming into the system so we don't have to talk about riparian access to the Jordan River for Palestinians. Um, if, that, if you were to change that discursive configuration, then the canal could be beneficial as, as a development project that has multiple stakeholders and benefits that, that go to each of those stakeholders. Um, but it's hard to see that in the cards with the, um, with the governments that cur currently exist. Uh, to the question on the piecemeal development, I think what Trottier and, uh, and her author were talking about is the tendency right now by donors to come up with, with isolated plans through which they implement wastewater treatment and reuse across the West Bank. So when I was here two years ago as a Fulbright scholar, I worked with an engineering scholar who had a set of wastewater treatment um, plants that he, or initiatives that he had implemented, some of which w that, that had been implemented in, in um, different villages using a cookie cutter system. And the result was in some villages they worked, in some villages they didn't. There wasn't a lot of understanding about uh, what made them work or, or not work in particular communities. And, and what became clear when I was asking questions was that there had been very little effort to integrate the implementation of the technology into local management structures. And so I think what, and what resonated for me in Trottier's work was that she found very much the same thing, that these are projects that are implemented on a timeline that's, that's determined by development, by uh, development agencies that generally doesn't allow for enough um, public participation because you have to get the thing done and implemented to use up the budget in a particular time frame. So, so it creates this, um, this implementation of the technology is not really integrated, but just a technology that potentially could do some good. Um, 
lastly, to the question about uh, to the the question about the current status of the Red Dead Canal. Um, it was my understanding that as of last month, the Jordanians were ready to go back and start working on it. But it has become a smaller project, and it's now almost uniquely about desalinized water for Jordan. And, it, and actually, they're not even really talking about its benefits for the Dead Sea at this point. Um, so it, it is one of the things that to me is fascinating about these big mega solutions is that they, um, is that there's a tendency, and this is true of the one that I cited in the United States as well, for them to, to roll out and evolve and change and to the point where they no longer resemble what they started out as, right? But they, but they don't quite go away. Um, and, but they allow my, what became interesting for me is that in both cases, they allow the, um, the dominant discourse to not be about the, the ecological crisis, but to be about how we're going to develop a new set of technologies that are going to fix it. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop at that. I actually do want to come back to Salim's point about rolling together drip irrigation and these very capital intensive initiatives. Um, I do think there's, there's um, what I will say is that while drip irrigation has been uh, accessible for Palestinian communities, there's now an increasing literature that is um, in the, among agronomists and ecologists that there are some real negatives of using drip irrigation. Um, uh, but beyond that, what I was really getting at was the way that the technology gets enrolled in this legitimation project for the settler society. So, you know, when people talk about drip, drip irrigation, when they did talk about drip irrigation as being new and innovative, they almost always referred to it as an Israeli technology. And, ad, and as such, it became this, um, this legitimation for what, what Israel has done in the, in, by settling in, in the land of Palestine. Um, so more, maybe we can move to other questions. Yes. Um, thank you for your lecture. But I'm going to talk in Arabic. لما ندرس فعليا احنا العلاقه بين اسرائيل والتكنولوجيا او استخدامها التكنولوجي كوسيله وبالنهايه بنربطها بالمشروع الاستعمار الاستيطاني وبمشروعها كقوميه او بتحاول تخلق قوميه الى اخره يعني مثلا مشروع تجفيف الحوله تم تجفيف الحوله بناء على ادعاءات قوميه وبنفس الوقت بالتسعينيات فكره الاستعاده البحيره كان على اساس مشاريع قوميه ففي عندنا إذا كان عملية تطبيع أو إنه إشي عادي لأن نستخدم التكنولوجيا أو إنه لنفس الهدف القومي يعني بكافة الأحوال إحنا نستخدم التكنولوجيا نستخدم نفس الأداة مثلا مشروع البحر الميت تم تجفيفه كمان لأغراض استيطانية وأغراض قومية وحاليا عم بحاول إنهم يستعيدوا عن طريق التكنولوجيا الأغراض الاستيطانية وأغراض قومية هلا أنا بالنسبة لي بسأل دائما إنه التكنولوجيا هي عبارة عن أداة وإنه استخدامها إشي طبيعي yes. كأداة بس ما زي كأنه في حلقة ناقصة ب يعني كون التكنولوجيا إشي طبيعي أو الاستخدامات المتناقضة لهي التكنولوجيا إشي طبيعي يعني ممكن هيك سؤالي بهال المحور بدور okay. Other questions? مثل خير باعتقادك بالنسبة لموضوع زي ما هو معروف الأنبوب المخصص لنقل 200 مليون متر مكعب من المياه للبحر الميت هو ما بوصل ما نسبة 10% من احتياجات حتى يرتفع اللي هو منسوب المياه من في البحر الميت طبعا نهيك عن الأثار البيئية السلبية باتجاه البحر الميت ولكن في ايضا استفاده من مساله اللي هو قناه البحرين اللي هي التبريد المستمر لمفاعل ديمونا وهذا مش كثير بتم التناول الحكي فيه 
ومساله اللي هو تطوير المستوطنات اللي راح تكون على طول الخط في المقابل انه الفلسطينيين تم محاوله اشراكهم في الاتفاقيه على اساس يكونوا واجهه لاستقطاب اموال المانحين لانه اسرائيل ما راح تكون قادر على استقطاب اموال المانحين بدون ما يكون في شريك على القليل الفلسطيني بدعوه تطوير هاي تطوير هاي المناطق الفائد الاكبر باتجاه بتروح باتجاه المشروع الاستيطاني الصهيوني في المنطقه هناك في تخوف ايضا من سعي اسرائيل لبناء مفاعل نووي اخر على طول القناه للاستفاده منها ايضا شكرا Is there a third question? Okay. So I, um, I will answer both of those. Those are excellent uh, questions. Um, the, the question about technology as a tool, I think that's exactly the point, is that um, technologies can be fabulous tools. But the question is what comes first? Is it the technology or is it the, um, is, is it the community process? So we started, with, we started this conference by talking about how to engage communities in planning efforts. I think that, get, that moves us towards how we should think about technologies. That ultimately, the technology becomes the mechanism through which one implements plans that are decided de democratically to, for the improvement of, of the society. The fear I have is that um, from reading over donor documents, the donor documents start with the technology and then often add on a community participation part at the end, arguing, and, and what that means then is that the idea is first to get the technology into the communities, and if you can engage the community along the way, that's a good thing. I, would, I think this is very much part of the Trottier article as well, is it? we've put in these technologies as if they solve the problem rather than, rather than thinking of them as tools. So it is, I think, um, it, the, the ideal would be to, to think of the ways that they could be integrated into the plans that are, um, that are in place to, to realize um, better, better dignity for Palestinians and to realize a, an emancipation, if you will, for Palestinians. Um, per your questions about the Red Dead Canal, I think you're, you're on to some, uh, your um, uh, understanding of the issue matches some of the real problems that I've read about it as well. It's not clear what Israel hopes to get out of it, right? And so we have these, uh, they, they, we have discussions of whether this is going to be an area for greater settlement expansion. Is this going to be about fueling nuclear reactors? Is this simply going to be about expanding the pie? Um, certainly Israel lost interest coincidentally with the development of their desal. So clearly if they were hoping that they were going to get desal from the Red Sea, um, out of this project, and that was what was driving their initial effort, um, it would make sense that they would lose interest as they've been able to d develop desal on the coast and um, improve their availability of water. Um, I think one of the real problems with the canal is the sort of murky uh, notions of benefit, right, that come with it. Um, and I think those have to be kept in mind as, as um, the canal moves forward and, and who will benefit, and ultimately, who will pay the costs. The concern, the pattern has always been that the costs are borne not by those who, who um, have the potential of, of getting the, the greatest benefit. And it's precisely that dynamic that I, that I think needs to be interrogated in, in greater depth. I would like to thank Professor Stephen for his uh, great presentation and I think among the important issues, especially for our students at the university, is uh, the attempt to connect uh, the Israeli Zionist uh, imperialist uh, settlement project with other projects under one title which is uh, the settlement expansion. So your 
intervention was in the core of uh, this notion and uh, I believe this one uh, was one of the most important interventions.